Ms. Sonansuit, it's a pleasure for us to have you here today. And there are uh, three questions I would like to uh, put to you. One is, while challenging behaviours have been theorised in many ways as a direct manifestation of neurological dysfunction or as an expression of unmet needs, um, we call that often the symptom symbol debate. Is it rather a symptom of a disease or a symbol of an unmet need? How much weight would you actually put on the unmet need idea? Do all challenging behaviours need really to be alleviated? Or are there some challenging behaviours you best leave alone? For example, some forms of vocalisation or erotic sexual st stimulation or auto-erotic stimulation like playing with the dough or uh, with other things like that. May it even cause harm to suppress or to prevent certain forms of challenging behaviour because they are only a violation of social norms but actually express a desire of communication. Okay, these are really two questions. The first is, uh, is all challenging behaviour an expression of unmet needs? So I don't know if they all are, but I do believe that a large proportion do express unmet needs and therefore uh, finding out what this unmet need could be and how can we allow the need to be met is a very important way to handle uh, challenging behaviours. Uh, of course, we don't know enough to say about all. Now, uh, I do think that in some cases uh, the behaviour itself addresses the need. Like you say, it may be playing with dough, it gives some stimulation, it may be walking, pacing, and but I do think that the social norms are of some importance because it affects how relatives and other people relate to the person. So when we allow for the, that expression of the need, I think it is useful to accommodate it within an environment that uh, makes it's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. So as I said, pacing, if it's done in an outdoor or indoor garden, is better than if it's done back and forth in a small corridor. Um, uh, if you like to play with uh, food or something, maybe it can be a baking hour. Uh, and so you play with dough because we're baking. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are many other, if you're playing sexually with yourself, maybe you can be put in your own room where it is acceptable uh, rather than being in the living room where everybody is. Uh, so there, there is a need to consider the social norms, but a lot of the behaviors can be accommodated uh, within the social norms. Of course, some behaviours do not address the need, they just express mm -hmm. it, like asking for help. Then we have to figure out what the unmet need is and address that, uh, rather than say, okay, she likes to say help me and we'll let her say help me all day. Okay, well, thank you very much. One of the most challenging behaviours for informal carers is empathy or withdrawal. And there's some debate in gerontology around the idea of that being a sign of gerontotranscendence. Some research even describes empathy as a resource against overstimulation. Contrarywise, most intervention studies recommend activity, preferably in an individually tailored design. How legitimate is it to accept and even to respect withdrawal and how necessary to keep up attention and contact even in spite of withdrawal? I think this is an important and difficult question. Uh, yes, there is now a trend to think of apathy as bad and uh, I do not know whether that is justified or not. In my opinion, uh, challenging behaviours 
are very nice in that sometimes they give us a feeling, a sense of what is the feeling of the older person. So if the person is apathetic or not doing anything, but you see that they are tapping or that there are signs of discontent, then I would say yes, there's something that needs to be done uh, to engage this person. And indeed, most people can be engaged to at least some extent. Um, but if there is no sign of discontent, I'm not sure if that needs to be um, a target for intervention. Uh, or maybe it only needs to be a target for intervention to the extent that engagement maintains some skills mm -hmm. so that you retain your ability to listen or to handle or uh, to move your fingers or do uh, that uh, maintain dexterity abilities. Uh, so I think some level of engagement is probably desirable, but in a way, maybe we are forcing our assumptions of a productive society that the minister spoke about on people with dementia, mm -hmm. and maybe if we understand dementia as a decline that occurs at the end of life, we should respect that decline, and in general, uh, I think that philosophy of accepting that there is going to be decline and that we know the uh, stages of that decline and respecting where the person is, is an important uh, part of dementia care. Therefore, when people cannot eat anymore, I think accepting that as part of the decline is important. Same with when people will not engage anymore. As long as they seem content. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, which is, of course, a difficult issue with relation to food and food regulations and um, um, yeah. absolutely, it's, it's this is ethically not, quite problematic. This yeah. is uh, something that uh, many of the current researchers and regulators uh, do not see that way. But uh, I think that uh, the philosophy of how we conceptualize dementia as an end-of-life disease mm -hmm. uh, is very important in care and that some of the regulation may not be correct. Now, I, I don't want to pretend that I have all the answers and I know everything, but I think that, I do think that we make assumptions about people with dementia based on other ages, other societal expectations that may not be correct. Okay, thank you. Most outcomes of intervention studies favor one-to-one -one contact. Um, there is a famous dictum of Barry Reisberg which basically says that the best intervention for people consists in the development of the personality of the carers, also the professional carers. This gives rise to the question, is it reasonable and meaningful to provide carers with assessments, inventories of interventions, special communication trainings like validation, sensory stimulation, all that, or is it rather more helpful to develop skills like attentiveness, mindfulness, resilience, cognitive empathy, self-efficiency, yeah? that is, contact and reflection related skills? So do we rather train carers in interventions or do we rather train them in developing their empathetic skills? Um. I'm not sure that these are our distinct categories. I think when we train them in interventions, we train them to communicate in a certain way mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, to have certain philosophies about uh, care. So uh, I think 
acceptance, attentiveness, uh, caring, empathy are all skills we want to help people attain, uh, as well as, as being self-reflective. As I mentioned before, I think being self-reflective is especially important in family member, when family members care for the person with dementia, because they tend to take things personally, because the uh, things may trigger past conflicts that are not so relevant anymore, and therefore realizing this is important. But again, um, I think we don't give enough uh, weight to carers having a philosophy about the treatment. So if the goal of treatment is that everybody eats uh, whatever the government said three times a day, you would have a totally different treatment than if the goal of treatment is the best well-being mm -hmm. uh, that the person can have, which means well-being means being content from time to time, having some moments of pleasure if possible, and not having negative uh, emotions. Um, so um, I think as a society, we have to decide what is our philosophy mm -hmm. about this disease. What are the goals? Is, it, is the goal to keep the people alive as long as possible? Is it to make them as content as possible? And that will dictate what we do. Yeah, all right. May I have a last question? Sure. Um, in the famous book of Tom Kitwood about dementia, he says that a central uh, psychological need is love. Now, that is, of course, a problematic concept, not a scientific concept. But he says what basically people need and want is love. Could you sort of make a short statement to that uh, idea of Kate Woods? Oh. <laughs> At first, I, I absolutely agree. And I think when I speak about loneliness, uh, that's a sense of belonging, of love. Uh, I think those are extremely important. Uh, I think that people uh, came to that activity uh, that I've uh, just seen on their own because they were looking for that connectedness, yeah. for some, uh, that support. I think the reason that people connect with dolls is because they want to love and be loved. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that those staff who are able to convey that kind of warmth and I, I do think good staff can, staff members can convey love to residents and get love from mm -hmm. residents. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful thing when it happens. And family members, when things are, when caring is successful, they can forget the issues of success and achieving this goal or that goal, and they can focus just on the love part. Mm -hmm. and, and once, again, the philosophy changes, and you realize this is what you want to get of those. You want for those years to have a good feeling about them. It doesn't matter if they're somewhat longer, somewhat shorter, if you got dressed at this time or at that time, if the house is cleaner or less clean, if that's your goal, um, then that changes the whole atmosphere. To my mind, because that's my philosophy, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But of course, people have, people individually and as a society have to decide what those goals are. Okay, thank you very much thank for you. that very interview.